Okay. We'll go okay. for this okay. and I will scroll it for you. How about that? Awesome. Perfect. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so, so I'll go ahead and start. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, everyone, I'd like to introduce Sarah Rizkella. She is here to talk to you today about a topic she's been working on and uh, is an MPH candidate here at National. So take it away, Sarah. All right. As um, Dr. Cook said, my name is Sarah. I am going to talk about syringe services programs today. So first, I wanted to um, kind of quiz you guys, see if you um, know anything about certain services programs or what your knowledge is about it. So the first question is true or false, certain service programs only exchange needles for those that need clean lingos. That's the only service they offer. So the answer is actually um, false. They have more than one ability. They are able to have different programs enabled within these syringe services programs, which I'll talk about later. Okay, and then my next question is um, true or another true or false. Our syringe service programs are legal, but not implemented in every state. And um, that is also actually false. There are states that have syringe service programs that are illegal, and there are some syringe service programs that are legal in other states, but are heavy, heavily regulated. And then there's only um, a few states that actually have legal syringe service programs without any regulation. Um, so this is more of an understanding of what your feelings are on syringe service programs or what your understanding is. So my last question is on a scale of one to five, how much do you agree with the statement below? And the statement is needle exchange programs encourage injection drug use. So um, hopefully by the end of the presentation, if you are more on the five where you highly agree with that statement, you become closer to the one where you um, disagree with that statement. So I'm gonna start now talking about the adverse effects of injection drug use. So there are different um, advan adverse effects of injection drug use. There's addiction, there's overdose. You can also get HIV or HCV. Um, HIV and HCV, which is hep C, are um, bloodborne pathogens that can be transmitted via blood or via sexually transmission. And there's human immunodeficiency virus and also hepatitis C, which is the hepatitis C virus. Um, mostly they are converted through blood when you are sharing a needle that has been used by somebody else. And then another adverse effect is abscesses. And those are painful collections of pus that um, occur after using a injection um, needle that is not as clean and can cause an infection in your, usually you see them in your arm or other sites that you inject at. Um, here are some more adverse effects. So according to the CDC, there are about 67,367 deaths in the United States in 2018 alone um, due to drug overdoses. About 14.2% 14 of um, HIV cases and about 13.4% of um, HIV cases are secondary to injection drug use. And then 72% of H, uh, hep C cases are secondary to drug use. This map here shows um, how prevalent HIV is throughout the United States. The lighter states in color, the lighter blue ones are a lower prevalence, the darker blues are the higher prevalence. And when we compare this to the map that certain services programs are legal and illegal later, you'll see kind of that the ones that have high prevalence of HIV also have illegal um, certain service programs. So we've got to be able to and advocate for these syringe service programs to be legal in all states, especially since there's a high prevalence of HIV throughout the United States. Um, so now I'm going to talk about what are syringe service programs. They are things that offer syringe exchanges or also referrals to shelters, transitional housing programs, food pantries. They can also do um, take home naloxone kits and naloxone can have Narcan, which is used to treat overdoses. Um, they also have harm reduction services to help those struggling with substance abuse disorders and other mental health issues. And at, in these certain service programs, the patients that are struggling with substance abuse are able to speak to staff without any kind of negative stigma that is surrounded with drug abuse. Um, most people that struggle with substance abuse disorder also have a 
um, kind of negative idea of going to health professionals because there is such a negative stigma around their lifestyle or their just habits that they're also trying to kick. They know what they're doing and they are trying to become better, but it's hard to do that when you're being judged for what you're doing. And also certain service programs offer HIV and HCV testing. So like I said before, it's not only exchanging clean needles for the dirty needles that they have. There's so much more to certain service programs than just needle exchange. Um, and here just shows how beneficial they are. In Orange County around Irvine, the HRA distributed about um, 12,500 doses of naloxone. And then because of this service program, 1,258 report um, of overdose reversals because of these naloxone kits that were distributed to people that are struggling with substance abuse disorder. Um, like I just said, take home naloxone programs decrease overall mortality rate from overdoses. There is also just review, reduced overdoses overall in a study in Florida. Um, they study how many admissions were responsible from overdoses before an implementation of a certain service program and then after implementation. So 20 um, admissions were secondary to overdoses of drugs and then um, most likely opioids. And then after the certain service programs, there was only six admissions, um, which is a huge difference just from one year of a certain service program. And then there's also just another study showing that the proactive implementation reduced the incidence of HIV and HCV by 90.3%, which is a huge significant um, reduction. And proactive means it's happening before we see HIV and HCV cases. And then the reactive implementation still has a big effect and reduces the HIV and HCV prevalence by, I mean, incidence by 60.8%, which is, again, really significant and just shows the benefits of these programs and how they're able to reduce overdoses and also admissions in hospitals and HIV and HCV cases. And there's also ways to help those that are not injecting drugs and not using are not struggling with substance abuse disorders. So you are decreasing the incidence of HIV and HCV in people that also do not inject drugs. Um, okay, so one other question that I have instead of me just rambling on, how many states uh, do you guys think have legal syringe services programs? Before this, I thought at least at least like 40 of our 50 states. But actually, if you look at this map over here, there is only about nine states where they're fully legal and without any um, restrictions on them. And then the darker blue states are the ones that have legal certain service programs, but there's a lot of restrictions on them, a lot of legal hoops to go through. And then the red states are, or the orange red states are completely illegal service programs. So if we compare this to the HIV prevalence, if you even notice Texas was dark blue and it's here in the prior one with a high prevalence of HIV and here it is bright red. So this shows that maybe if we had a certain service program there, our HIV incidence would drop a little bit. So this is a really important reason to have certain service programs, not just to, you know, how some people think, encourage drug use by giving people an, a way out. It's also just to kind of improve the overall health of the United States, improve our prevalence of HIV, kind of reduce all the overdoses, just help people overall. Um, okay, so now I have some final questions to summarize everything. So uh, what are some adverse effects of injection drug use? So we just talked about HIV and overdose. There's a few more that we didn't ramble on about in this uh, presentation. And those are addiction, which is a really hard thing for someone to struggle with, and additionally, abscesses, which are not painful. I mean, not fun. They're super painful. I work in the ER, and I see people really struggling with them. They're not able to sit. They're, like, not able to move their arms. They're really hard to, to live with. So then you have to get it incised and drained. You have to have a lot of follow-ups. And... For people that already have such a negative stigma around them, they're not going to want to go in for these follow-ups. So they're just going to continue getting abscesses and just continue struggling and suffering. Um, so what are some resources and services that syringe programs offer other than exchanging a dirty needle for a clean needle? So um, as I said earlier, they offer food pantries, 
services to sh homeless shelters, um, referrals to any harm reduction services. They also do HIV and HCV testing. They have naloxone kits, which again, naloxone is those has Narcan in it, which helps treat overdoses. And that way you're able to reverse all these overdoses and save people's lives. Um, and so on a scale of one to five, hopefully now you guys are at a one, showing that needle exchange programs don't actually encourage injection drug use, but they actually help people become healthier and also just, you know, survive their struggle with substance abuse disorders. Okay, and here are all my resources that I've been able to use for this presentation. If you have any other questions, you guys can email me at um, sarahmrescala at gmail.com. I have an H in my name, and my name is in the beginning of the presentation as well. Sarah, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a quick question. Um, okay. I um, was doing some work in Pennsylvania about five years ago. I was teaching there. And at that time, they were just starting to implement Mm -hmm. um, syringe programs in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Yeah. And I noticed on your map that it was um, one of the states that is actually considered either legal or um, that there aren't laws regarding. Is it, is it the dark blue state in there? It was, uh, a, uh, let's get back. Yeah, let's go. It's a light blue. It's a light blue state. So that means that they have fully legal syringe service programs. They okay, so that must be new. And I know that what was happening was um, some of the jurisdictions like Philly and Pittsburgh were operating them under sort of a mayoral decree. Mm -hmm. So the mayor basically said, we're gonna go ahead and operate these things, <laughs> forget yeah. what the state says. Is that another option for some of these places where places where maybe it is desperately needed, um, even if the state is not able to legalize it? Do you have thoughts oh, on that? That is a really good question. Um, I'm not really sure, but I don't see why it wouldn't be. I would have to do some more research on that. Um, but I, I do know, like, at least in California, like the state I'm in, that the, the way they're able to jump through these legal hoops is by having um, doctors be there. They are like, they have to have a medical professional on board. And so that's how they were able to jump through some of the hoops and having them there. But, you know, sometimes that's not really realistic because these doctors are already kind of contracted through other companies or they're working at private practices. And, you know, it's not very, um, you don't want to just like hire anybody for these certain service programs because you don't want to continue implementing this negative stigma. Um, under mayoral decree, though, I'm not really sure if um, they've been able to do that, but it is, I know now it is legal in Pennsylvania, so there must have been some changes to it mm -hmm. since you've been there. How long ago was that? About five years ago that I was there, so. So maybe uh, they encouraged some yeah, and like I said, Pittsburgh and Philly were already doing it. We were looking into having one operate in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is a much smaller city and also a more conservative city. So, so it might be like legal in the whole state, but some cities are harder to get that in. Mm -hmm. Because I know like in, in the Orange County area, they're very against it because they're like, oh, it's just only going to encourage drug use and it's only going to bring around like homeless looking people or anything like that kind of just like it's gonna dirty what my city looks like kind mm -hmm. of idea, which is crazy but you know mm -hmm. it is a thought process so there might be a lot of legislation that they had to jump around in that particular city mm -hmm. do any of these operate as mobile um operations or are they always at a at a clinic site I think a, a few of them have to be mobile um, mm -hmm. just because of the need to move around because of the loops, uh, the hoops, not loops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I think some of them are like in like community services areas. Um, I think it depends on each, each state, each city, what they're able to do. Um, one last question I have. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I also wanted to ask if um, there are opportunities that you're aware of that people might be interested in getting involved either locally or through advocacy. I know you mentioned they could send you an email, but there are a few quick little pointers you could give as far as getting involved. Um, I think just kind of reach out to your um, like resources in the in the community. I know that 
um, different universities or med schools and things like that, they are also volunteering and stuff. One of my friends, she goes to UCI Med and she was able to get involved through certain service programs because they are linked together and they have volunteer programs through that. So I think just check out the resources around you, the universities, the hospitals, see what they're able to do. Um, if they need any help with that, they are more than welcome to reach out with for to me and I can help them find some resources around them. Awesome, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. Um, and it, I think also your, your presentation also highlights the fact that the HIV AIDS epidemic in the United States is still something that we need to be considering and we don't, it, it, there's a tendency to <laughs> think that this is something that has disappeared and, and in some places it maybe has disappeared but it's also re-emerged in places where yeah. we don't actively provide these things. Yeah, I think there was exactly. an outbreak in Indiana recently um, fairly large ones. So um, thank you, for your, first of all, for your work <laughs> that you're doing. I love when I see students doing important work, but also just kind of the awareness this creates on, on multiple topics. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for letting me uh, present to your class. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.